How do you run an agile organization at scale? And when I mean scale, I mean billions and billions and billions of dollars in budget and hundreds of thousands of people. Today on episode number 296 of CXO Talk, that is what we are discussing. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Now, before we begin, I want you right this second, please subscribe on YouTube and tell your friends, tell your family to come watch right now. So I'm very thrilled today. We have two amazing guests. David Bray is the executive director of People Centered Internet, and he is today my guest co-host, and he's also a subject matter expert on the topics that we are discussing. Hey, David, how are you? It's great to see you back on CXO Talk again. It's great to be with you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. And James Hondo Gertz is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy who is responsible for acquisitions and technology. And Hondo, how are you? Thank you. This is your first time on CXO Talk and we're just thrilled you're here. Yeah, awesome to be part of the show here and look forward to talking with you. Okay, so let me ask you uh, both briefly to describe your work. David, why don't we begin with you and just, just very briefly tell us about people-centered internet. I'll be very brief because really the star of the show is the Assistant Secretary. Um, but People Centered Internet is a coalition aimed at making sure we can have the future internet that benefits us all versus just a few. We try to do demonstration projects that measurably improve people's lives. One of our uh, co founders and chairs is Vince Cerf, and so we are really focused on the unfinished work of the internet going forward. Wonderful. I know. Uh, I know it's a it's a topic that you're very passionate about. And Hondo, would you briefly tell us about your role as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy? Sure. So uh, I've got the great pleasure of leading and supporting a, a team of about sixty thousand folks who develop and field and support all the uh, technology and equipment and uh, services for all the Navy and the Marine Corps. Okay, so clearly this is a, a very large role. What are the, the focus points? What are your objectives in this role? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So it is a, about a $60 billion a year enterprise, you know, and focused on supporting all our Marines and sailors all over the world. So that, so the, you know, the real focus there is delivering and supporting them around the world and making sure they've got the equipment, the latest technology, and all the support they need because they're doing uh, the nation's work worldwide and we need to be there supporting them. The, the big piece of that is uh, delivering reliability, um, being very agile in our support, making sure we're good stewards of the taxpayer and being affordable, uh, and then uh, most importantly, developing our talent so we can sustain that capability and sustain the nation's defense uh, for the future ahead. So you raise a key point. You mentioned the term agile, and I guess it gets right to the, to the very heart of what we're talking about today. With an organization of that size and scope, how is it possible to be agile? And in that context, what does agile actually mean? Yeah, it's a great question and I think a great challenge. Uh, obviously, you can't do that um, without a, a vision and a mission to rally around. And so the great news for us is we've got, you know, I can't think of a better mission uh, supporting our sailors and Marines all around the world. Uh, and so, you know, the first key is wrapping what we do around them. And, and agility to me is both, um, I think we use the innovation word a lot. That's a little harder for me to understand. Agility to me is how fast can we pivot to new problems, adapt to new circumstances, uh, and then create the future we want, uh, not just react to it. So innovation, you don't like innovation. Um, David, I'd love for you to also weigh in on the distinctions between innovation and agility for an organization of this type. Sure, and I, I just want to sort of uh, recognize what Secretary Gertz, or if, if we can Hondo's, use your nickname, Hondo's, Hondo's, yeah. nickname. He, he goes by Hondo, so yeah. we'll use that. <laughs> I think it was very key what he was saying in a sense that it's, it's important to talk about the outcomes you want 
too often we use the word innovation almost as like a buzzword and it becomes almost like pixie dust that we sprinkle to everything. What I really have the respect for is actually thinking about what are the outcomes we want to have achieved. So, so we can be for innovation, mm -hmm. but it's a means towards a more specific outcome that could be, for example, how do we do have more pivot speed or faster pivot speed, or how do we have more agility in it? Uh, how do we be more adaptable? And to me, this is really the fundamental challenge of the world is changing so rapidly externally. Uh, in fact, one might even say we're in a period of exponential change, mm -hmm. that our ways that we used to do things in the 1950s or the 1960s, it just doesn't scale for this period right. of accelerated external change. And, you know, in a perfect world, you'd be a small startup. But I don't think the Navy has yeah. the luxury of saying, let's start from scratch and become a small startup. And so it's this really interesting and important challenge for how do you take large organizations and make them as nimble and adaptive as what small startups can do, at the same time do the important mission that the Navy does around the world. Yeah, what's, what's interesting, you know, I, as, I came from being a Special Operations Command, which is, at least within the government, you know, thought of as a very small, nimble organization. And so, uh, you know, looking at the challenge of getting, you know, small organization feel and big organizational size is, is a great challenge and opportunity. You know, a couple of ways we're getting after that is, I think you've got to be very comfortable with decentralization. Uh, so rather than trying to make the big organization look like a small one, make your big organization look like lots of small organizations, which all have their um, you know vision and focus area synchronized. Uh, but if you try and control it all in one centralized hierarchy, it gets really really challenging. And 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 so innovation at scale to me is about how do you break down. Um, these large organizations, uh, you have to have a consistent vision and mission, but you've got to have comfort letting them uh, task organize and execute uh, their own way. Well, I guess, uh, you know, hi, it, it sounds in principle, in theory, this sounds fairly straightforward, but I suspect that the execution of it is a little bit more difficult. And so how, how do you go about in a practical way uh, putting this into practice? Yeah, I th I, again, I think you start with a common vision and mission focus. And then you, you, you break down and decentralize to the lowest layer of um, accountable and capable decision making. Uh, and so it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. You decentralize, but then you try and increase your transparency so you don't create lots of little silos. And so getting that balance is, is uh, challenging. Uh, and, and so we've been working hard at that. So it takes you know, a pretty agile knowledge management system. I think another big piece of it is um, proving, you know, it's all about culture and talent and, and proving to your organization that uh, you actually have their back uh, and that you're there to support them, not to, uh, you know, just to knock them upside the head when they, that when they do something wrong. So getting that organizational trust is a, is a really key uh, element of it. And it takes a lot of leadership and thought and talent development. I don't know, David, from your experience, is that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, and I, as you know, Michael, I mean, I've had experiences in different roles where similar sort of challenge of how do you move fast, and also, as, as Hondo said, how do you build trust? Uh, because you're asking people to do something different than they're used to doing. They may have been doing it the same way for 10 or 15 years. That is very disoriented to people. And so it's the level of sort of showing you have their back, that you're there to be their human flak jacket. Uh, when something goes wrong, you take the hit. You don't necessarily have it sprinkle and fill on down to them. Uh, and that's, that's something that also has to be communicated in a very challenging environment in which we're underneath public scrutiny. Right. And we have to have those conversations as well. The other thing that I thought that Hondo said that was really key is there's Tom Malone, Professor Tom Malone at MIT, mm -hmm. talks about collective intelligence, which is both the human workforce element, but also technology elements being collectively smarter together. Right. And I think this is key as to how we're going to deal with the information overload challenges, the transparency necessary to collaborate synchronously, synchronously across the organization in a distributed sense. And at the same time, some of it's also going to require some experiments, right. because this has never been done before at the scale that you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, another key concept for me is uh, differentiation. And so you also don't want to fall in the trap of being, um, going from a more bureaucratic organization to just completely free-for-all. 
And, and, and so I think a lot about creating multi-dexterous organizations. So in the Navy, you know, we're building aircraft carriers and submarines that are going to last for 50 years. Um, so how I think about building those with uh, the safety and security we need there is a little bit different than how I think about the combat systems on those submarines and aircraft carriers that we want to change every 12 months, 18 months, maybe every day. And so you've got to differentiate the work and, and kind of get away from a one-size-fits-all process. So I've seen some folks try and you know, move, move the whole organization to a rapid innovation organization. That may not be the right answer either. And so sorting that out and then sorting your talent out and your processes out that they can handle both sides of that spectrum is a, is a challenge. But I think when you focus on that, you can get away from the kind of flash in the pan innovation that, that many people have experienced. Now, I just want to remind everybody that as we're talking with Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Hondo Gertz, and with David Bray, who's the Executive Director of People-Centered Internet, there's a tweet chat taking place right now using the hashtag CXOTalk, and you can ask questions. And in fact, we have a really interesting question from Gus Beckdash who makes the point that when you are conducting research, you don't always have a clear understanding of the outcomes. And so in an environment where control and really managing risk is so important, how do you deal with the uncertainty of, 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 of outcomes? So I think I go back a little bit to, to differentiating the work and understanding risk and opportunity. And, and I think sometimes we get too focused on managing risk and not leveraging opportunity. And so as we differentiate the work and we think about research and learn fast and rapid iteration speed, that's where you want to be efficient in doing a lot of things quickly and then leveraging the things that work and moving past the things that didn't work. You don't necessarily want to do that in a, say, major ship construction that takes multiple billion dollars and multiple years that you're going to have for 50 years. And so playing those two skills together is important. You don't want to do innovative research like you do a nuclear submarine, and you don't want to do nuclear submarines necessarily like you do innovative research. Uh, and having an organization that can respect that diversity of purpose and process is you know about that's a lot of what we're doing about here instead of fighting the diversity leveraging it and using it as your key enabler and yeah. then actually to build on what hondo said yeah. i mean the research actually shows that a diversity both in terms of experiences and and approaches but also in terms of processes actually does benefit an organization better yeah. and so it's not trying to be a monoculture or one size fits all the other thing that i think hondo said that was really key is recognizing it's not just about risk management, but also about opportunity management and how you can be a fast learning mm -hmm. organization. One of the things I like to talk about as well, Project Corona in 1958, 1959, was an attempt to launch a rocket that would take a photo of the Soviet Union, parachute a film canister that would then be picked up before it landed into the ocean. This was 1958, 1959, way before the space mm -hmm. race. The first 13 rockets blew up on the launch pad. It wasn't until about attempt number 21, 22 that it finally succeeded and it turned out to be a very useful benefit during the Cold War, but even more interestingly, it was later declassified in 1995, bought by a company that was later bought by Google, and became the basis for Google Maps. Hmm. So that investment hmm. that happened back in 1950s, right. 1960s, was a sort of huge return on investment. But imagine nowadays we tried to do something like that, how long would it be before attempt number five or six with the rockets before someone said, we need to have a hearing, what's going hmm. on over here? And so. You have to say, what are the opportunities in addition to risk management? And as Hondo said, when it comes to building something that's nuclear powered or something like that, maybe you want to be much more on the risk management side. But when it comes to actually doing things that move us forward and are those bets that play to the future, maybe you want to be bold and be brave and benevolent more on that side because that's necessary for the future ahead. Right. So that ambidextrous organization is really, I think, a key piece of it. But, but you got to have focus. Uh, and and you've got to have a kind of higher purpose in mind, and so, you know, grounding both ends of that spectrum in the mission uh, is uh, is critical. 
Now, as I was speaking, Honda, with your team in preparation for this conversation, and I have to give a shout out to Danny because he was awesome, Danny on, on Hondo's team. Uh, and, and he was talking about the concept of a minimal, minimum viable product, really talking in, in startup terms. And I thought that was striking given the, the difference in resources, obviously in scale of a small company relative to the Navy as an organization. And yet you're trying to embrace those, those kind of startup concepts. And maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, certainly a lot of my experience at Special Operations Command has uh, shaped it, but um, I think the Navy historically has also done a pretty good job of this. If you look back to the early submarines or naval aviation, some of it's just relearning some of those skills. And one of the things I've found is if you can close the distance down between operator, technologist, and acquisition person, you can get that iteration rate up and you can um, think of things in terms of multiple product cycles back to back. Folks now talk about agile software. Well, you can do the same thing in programs. You can build your first prototype. If that works, then you can build on it. If it doesn't work, then you can stop and pivot to a different direction. Um, the, tr the trick is too often we've let the developer def define the minimal viable product, and it's really gotta be the operator that defines it. Uh, and so that dialogue is, uh, is, is really critical. And so we're doing a lot of work with how do we improve our communication with end user and and get our speed up and so we can get you know rapid turning iterations uh, the the other value that gives us is if we need to we can take those products immediately into the field uh, and provide capability to the soldiers and sailors and marines if they're not quite mature then we can keep maturing those products uh, along a path but it'll be much better informed uh, with that input. So so your goal then is to get the, when you say the operator, essentially the, the end users involved in the acquisition process so that that chain is very direct and the people who are, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I'm in, interpreting so that the chain is very short and therefore the people who are the developers, the manufacturers are much closer to the actual needs of of the users without so many intermediaries. Is that a correct interpretation? Yeah, sure. So another way to think of it is, traditionally government acquisition has been very transactional. The, the using community will come up with a requirement, they'll hand that to the budgeting folks, they'll budget the money. When the money's budgeted, we'll start the acquisition. When the acquisition's done, we'll hand it back to the user. So think about making those much more parallel processes. And you know, one of the things the Navy and the Marine Corps has done really, uh, I think a, uh, a, an important job is there's actually a forum where I will sit down with the Chief of Naval Operations or the Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, the most senior um, military member in the service, and we'll look at a problem together with our collective staffs so we can agree on what's the minimal viable product, what are the different paths to get there, and how quickly can we get that into the field and move away from a multi-year transactional kind of process. And sort of to build on what Hondo was saying, Michael, I mean, I think it's really key that he's, it's a learning organization, right. and it's a learning organization in parallel as opposed to waiting for things in series, because it's not necessarily that you can have the luxury of waiting that long right. for things to play themselves out. And so everybody's involved, and you've empowered the operators to say what they need, but you've also brought the top-level leadership to be present at the same time, so everyone's mutually learning, and they're sort of accelerating that feedback loop. So in some respects, you're, doing, you're taking what was talked about, how you move from waterfall processes to agiles in the software world, right. and you're doing it for the entire organization. Trying to, and again, doing that at scale with the kinds of dollars we're talking about can be, can be challenging. So the other piece is break the work down into smaller projects. Uh, and so it's not kind of the big bang theory all the time. You can have you know pieces of products you can move forward at different different rates, and uh, and so it's all going back to you know the 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 national defense strategy is pretty clear. You know we need to compete and win in the future kind of global um, environment. We are not going to do that doing business as usual either in terms of processes or doing uh, the things we've always done. So we're trying to take advantage of 
this great revolution that's occurring in collaboration and user-based design and parallel processing and startup and apply that to very large, traditionally bureaucratic organizations. Great challenge, great opportunity. I have to give a shout out to Hondo because remember, I mean, this is all about making the battleship turn faster. Right. So you, you chose the Mission Impossible. Yeah. <laughs> we have another question from Twitter and Arsalan Khan is asking whether you distinguish between organizational innovation, I know you don't like that term, uh, between organizational uh, innovation and the individual contributions that people make and how do you how do you distinguish and how do you harness both of those things the individual and the organization yeah and, and that's a fabulous question i mean we could talk and i you know we talk days on people and culture because this is all if you don't have the right talent in the right culture the processes aren't going to get you there uh, and so what i'm trying to you know look forward to doing is create the environment where we leverage diversity, whether that's in skill set or process or technical knowledge towards a collective mission. And so in that sense, I think if you can create an environment that uh, people are empowered, that they're valued for what they bring to the table, no matter where they come from, and that the organization can quickly capitalize on ideas as they come up, whether it's bottom up, top down, or sideways, or in between, then I think you can get both individually based innovation, technology innovation, and organizational innovation. I think if you try and do each of those separate, kind of as a question applied, it's really hard to get there. Um, because I, I think if people understand the mission and feel comfortable in the culture, the innovations will pop up. If they don't, then they're going to be those innovations will be fighting upstream, and, and it, it can get really challenging to to unlock the power. You know, part of my leadership view is is how do you unlock discretionary effort? Uh, and 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 I think that's what startups do well. The, the, they can unlock that that thirst and power and and bring it everybody together with a sense of urgency. Um, that's what the Secretary of Navy is looking for. How do we operate with a sense of urgency individually and organizationally? And the only way you can do that is unlocking uh, the culture and then allowing the talent to take you there. And sort of the build on that, and also you've talked, um, and maybe you could share a little bit, the incentives you give your staff and your yeah. team, it's both the idea that there's individual recognition, but you can also do unit citations right. or mentorous units, so you can recognize both the individual and the group. And then also is it the case that you ask people to intentionally have as one of their sort of performance criteria something that might not work out? And so could you elaborate a little bit yeah, more about so, that? Yeah, so it's interesting. I've, you know, I've, everybody's talked about fail faster and, and you know, we want to, you know, we want you to take the edge of boundary, but that we never measure folks for that. So the number, number one reportable item on all my folks' performance reports is they've got to do at least one major initiative every year that's got uh, a chance of failing of at least 50%. Uh, now again, judgment is uh, uh, is used here, so we don't want to fail at the law or do we want to fail at uh, something that would make something uh, unsafe. Uh, but I have found if you don't make that part of the way you measure performance, you'll never get the performance. Uh, and I've also found most folks just want to feel like what they're working on is important and what their effort, uh, their effort means something. The good news in uh, in my job is we got a great mission, you know, helping to protect the country and and enable our sailors and Marines. So most of the recognition really is just that folks' ideas can really help and are valued. They're not working in just a bureaucratic process piece. I don't know if that gets at what you're going oh, exactly, for. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's all about that sense of purpose and the inspiration and, yeah. and what gets rewarded. What you measure is what is good and right. rewarding is what actually gets done. And so I right. think that's how you inspire people. I have to assume that creating that culture of failing fast and iteration in a highly risk averse environment, again, has got to be easier said than done. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and I don't like the, the term fail fast. I like learn fast. Right. So, I, you know, we're not here to fail, uh, but we are here to learn. And then I think if you can manage where you want to take risk and where you don't, uh, back to this differentiating the work, then you can have both. 
uh, and that's what we're really after, especially an organization of this size. But you've got to talk very bluntly about that internally and with the workforce, and they've got to have the trust that the leadership will be there to support them. Uh, and so when, when I think of an org chart, I'm at the bottom of the org chart. My job is to support everybody above me, give them the culture, give them the trust, uh, and let them uh, go attack the problem. And, and again, kind of be the pulling guard on the football team, not the quarterback. And how do you measure these kinds of results? Yeah, I mean, I think it. you can measure it in a lot of different ways. It's one of those that's hard to measure discreetly, although, you you know, you've got to actually track output. Um, but I've also found if you create the workplace of choice, you get the choice of the best workforce. Uh, and so, you know, the way I measure it is organizational output. Uh, so I, I look at the output. I'm not a process measurement person as much as an output focus. So I think if you can focus on the output, uh, and then drive the culture and the norms, then that helps That helps really get there. Uh, but you've got to have it, you've got to be grounded in output. Are, you know, are we improving our ability to support the sailors and the Marines? That's my bottom line. There's a hundred little uh, measurements in between, but it's all about supporting the folks uh, out there on the line uh, that we're here for. So you're looking very clearly at the outcomes rather than just achieving certain process milestones. You're looking at the at the correlating to results. Yeah, so I think that exactly what, what Hanna was saying is it's the output that matters. At the right. end of the day, everything there's there's several things internally that may give you a sign if you're going the right direction, but if you're not actually addressing the the soldiers, the sailors, the workforce as a whole then you're actually going to miss that opportunity. You know, you're going to be missing and not looking in the right place. That also helps with the whole mantra of one team, one mission, mm -hmm. focus on what really matters. And it's, it's really, I think it's in some respects, it's trying to encourage an entrepreneurial spirit within the workforce as a whole to be creative problem solvers for how we can get things done better. And it's the idea, that, again, like you talked about, like where you're trying to incentivize and motivate people to focus on how can we go beyond just trying to meet our own job descriptions but learn from this, and I, I really like how you said it is about learn fast, uh, and, and, and recognize that has to be a conversation we have outside beyond just the workforce as a whole. We've also have to have conversations with the public and say, look, the Navy that you knew in the 1950s and 1960s is still going to hold true to its principles, but it's got to figure out how to move in this exponentially changing world in a different way, and so we need to recognize that, one, we want to bring that talent in, so come here if you want to be that sort of change agent or that new navigator of how to navigate this new landscape. And then two, we want to work with different partners and how we're going to actually move this forward as well because it can't just be one group that solves it all. And there is no textbook for how to do this at the size that you're doing. I mean, I had it on a smaller size, but even then that was nowhere near the size you've got and the challenges you've got. Um, I think looking back 10 to 15 years from now, we'll say these were the moments that figured out how to make organizations be able to survive in an exponential era. And it's going to require some experiments, some learning, and exactly the idea of leaders that are willing to be there for their team to take the flack and to be the ones that sponsor and encourage them to move forward. Yeah, I mean, so we haven't talked technology per se, and, 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 I'm, and I think organizational innovation is somewhat separate from technology, but you know, there's some, there's some state changes in technology in terms of artificial intelligence and digital connectiveness and all the way through digital design. And so part of what we've also got to do is create the culture that we are as willing to prototype and process and how to use that technology in how we think about building and supplying the troops, not just the technology on the battlefield. And so, you know, it's a really interesting thought on digital-based system engineering, um, digital-based shipbuilding. You know, for the first time now, we have ships where we have full of digital models before we build them. And so that enables a whole other way of thinking in terms of how we manage that, how we actually get the work done. And so I think if you can make those problems available to the workforce in a culture that they feel like they can go off and try things and push for better benefit, um, then we've got a huge opportunity ahead of us. And that, and, and that if we can get the culture right, then you can get away from, you know, kind of flash in the pan initiatives and get in sustainable uh, innovation, not just 
you know, monthly innovation or daily innovation or even annual innovation. You can get on a, a completely different trajectory. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, that the, the the digital capabilities that you're developing, and maybe just give some context for the people listening who don't un, who don't who may not have the the background to appreciate what having a digital model of of a ship actually means and and involves. Yeah, and I'll, I'll maybe talk about it in in two different dimensions. So so one dimension is building new ships. So. We have two of the most complex models in the world. One's a nuclear submarine and one's a nuclear aircraft carrier. Traditionally, tens of millions of man hours to build uh, and design. So now if you can start with design tools, you can create better designs from the start. And so there's an element of how do you design it better? Then that can move right into how do you build it better? And then once it's built, then how do you sustain it better? But technology is also letting us take traditional ships that were built by old, you know, the older methods, and now you can digitally scan those ships, and when we need to repair the ships, you know exactly what that ship looks like as it comes in for its repair. And then, so it's for everything from planning the work to uh, certifying the work. So, I mean, imagine a visual um, or augmented reality as you're checking off work and you can compare it to a picture, if it matches a picture, you're done. You don't have to measure with protractors and kind of the old school. Uh, and then, you know, that's in construction, which traditionally is a sweat and muscle work. On the combat system stuff, you can imagine getting all the way to the point where I can upload a new app to my ship in a day and create a whole new capability to address uh, a new mission challenge or something else we've learned or a new threat. So both of those are, you know, I think really going to drive some innovation in the way we think about traditional Navy programs. Because I'm a geek, I have to ask, uh, so regarding the augmented reality capabilities you were just describing, are you actually using that? I mean, I've seen uh, software vendors give, give me demos of uh, AR in manufacturing, but the headsets are too big. I mean, it's, it, they're sort of prototypes. It, I haven't really seen it being used in a big way. So are, are you actually? Yeah, if you go to some of our shipyards now, and what's, what's interesting is you would kind of think that it would only be the new generation of, of you know, somebody who's just joined in the last couple of years that would adopt it. And it's really fascinating, once you show what's possible to, say, a master shipbuilder, they can put together the practical knowledge with the new technology to really get you know, some, some impressive results, and the adoption rate uh, is really uh, going up. So doing this at scale, obviously, is a challenge. Um, the, the, the other piece that we don't talk enough about in AI is how to help train folks faster. So about 50% of our shipbuilders have less than five years experience. So I can wait 20 years until they have 25 years experience, or I can look for new methods to give them the same experience level much more quickly. Uh, and so that's another very interesting thing. There's a, there's a boom in our requirements for shipbuilders. Uh, and so you know, how do we address that workforce challenge? Technology is gonna play a big piece in it. And to get to your question, Michael, I mean, yes, I think we've seen some things in the Valley that maybe aren't ready for prime time yet coming out of California and other places around the United States. But the benefit of what the Navy's culture and environment has is, is they've got a mission. They've got to get things done. They've got to make it work. And, and part of what's sort of the ethos of that culture is you, you work with what you've got right. and you make it work, even if it's necessarily uncomfortable initially. You'll figure out a way to actually work into the environment. I mean, if you've ever been on a ship... They are some pretty tight quarters, but they make it work. And so I share that because I think, in some respects, that positive pressure to make it work with what you've got at hand, even if it's still in a prototype phase or something like that, and then have that sort of be shared amongst the crew as a whole, that actually creates the right environment that makes sure what you're producing is actually towards an outcome right. that is positive versus just an interesting thought experiment that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, there, there, there's nothing like a real problem to you know, help speed the acceleration of technology. And so, you know, your conversation on minimal viable product, I think we're at the point where there are a number of minimal viable products that will really help us move forward. Our challenge is how to scale in this arena 
and and create um, the real um, state change we're looking for. Because quite frankly, you know, we've got you know for the American taxpayer, we've got to drive costs out of these large programs. And for our warfighter, we've got to deliver the equipment more reliably, more quickly. And so these technologies help us really drive down some fundamental new innovation paths that weren't available to us 20 years ago. A lot of the people who watch this show are technologists. And so one of the things that I'm wondering, and I'm sure other people will as well, is when you talk about these technologies, to what extent are you developing the technology yourself? And to what extent are you using off the shelf software or hardware and or hardware? Yeah, I think if anybody's ever followed me, they know uh, I'm not that smart, but I'm a pretty good poacher. So if somebody's already done it, the fastest way to get there is take what they've done and move it forward. And, and so I, I would say it's a mix. There's a lot of base technology out there, but there's innovation required in thinking about how to apply the technology in new ways. That's different than, you know, a pure technology innovation. So where we've had really good luck is, is really, again, I talked about closing that distance down um, between the end user, the developer, and the buyer. And, and what I found in my time at Special Operations Command was there was a lot of technology available to solve problems. We didn't know to ask for the technology, and the technologists didn't know how we might apply it. And so another thing we're doing in the Navy is really creating collaboration points for that to occur. Uh, especially with non-traditional small businesses. So we've, we've awarded a number of consortium kind of contracts, which are commercial-based contracts, that will uh, allow us, I think, a much broader way to interact at a much less iteration cost. Uh, and so it gets better, you know, s speed is an enabler, velocity is a competitive advantage. So I've got a lot of folks thinking about how to best um, put together those models. Uh, and I think the Navy is, uh, is out in front in many of those regards. I love what you said. Velocity is our competitive advantage. It, David, we have less than 10 minutes left. And what, what, should, we, what should we ask Kondo that, that we haven't already that is really important that we, sh that we should talk about in the last 10 minutes? You've definitely covered the whole gamut of what you're trying to look at. I guess I would ask two, a two-part question, which is first, are there ways that people on the outside that may want to engage, maybe not to sell you something, because mm -hmm. I mean there, there's processes for that, but more if they have ideas or they have insights, are there ways they can engage the Navy and help sort of move things forward? And then the other thing would be, uh, you know, as a senior executive, I mean, you have only so many hours in a day. Um, how, how do you both renew and sustain yourself, and how do you also sort of learn from, from others in terms of how to ha have the same energy and enthusiasm to keep up with this exponentially changing world? Yeah, it's, uh, maybe I'll take the last one first and then wrap back around. I, I think part of it is you've got, as a, as a senior leader, have to be somewhat comfortable not controlling it and, and, and letting, uh, you know, creating the right vision, creating the right right and left parameters, but not feeling like everything has got to be controlled by you specifically, even though you're likely responsible for it. And, and I have, I've learned that over the years, and it's you've got to be comfortable in that. Um, the second piece is being able to create enough time so you can plan for the unplanned. Uh, and so thinking about what might happen, or so it gets back to this velocity, um, you know, being able to think, you may not know exactly what the new problem is, but if you think about your organization and tailor it to be able to pivot to a new problem as it pops up, uh, I think is, has been helpful. Uh, to your first question, we're, we're trying to make that easier, both in terms of uh, getting the word out, here are opportunity spaces to interact, uh, and quite frankly, also even in the business, making the business much easier. Uh, and, and so I think as you've watched a lot of our, our consortiums, uh, we've got things called warfare centers all across the country. Uh, my job is to help get the word out 
and create those touch points that enable uh, great folks to help the military. One of my greatest fears in life is there's a good idea somewhere out there in the country and it can't get to the person that can action it. Uh, and so, I, you know, I'm, I'm confident everybody in the country wants to help our military. Uh, I'm not as confident they know how. And, and that's part of where I'm spending a lot of my, you know, I would say um, uh, future thinking and, and, you know, trying to, again, you've got to challenge is freeing up the time yep. to do it. Uh, but again, even great forums like this, just to talk openly about the challenges and the opportunities, I think help better connect our military to the population. And we've got some big challenges. Um, and we're not going to get there on our own. We're going to get there with the power of everybody working together. I've got to enable that better from my position. And Michael, I want to actually just sort of footnote what Hondo said. I think we should actually call it Hondo's Law. I mean, we had <laughs> Joy's Law, which is no matter where you go, most of the best people work for someone else. But I think Hondo, <laughs> we should have Hondo's Law, which was his greatest fear is somewhere out there is someone that has a good idea for the country, but they can't get it to someone that can action it. And I think we should actually sort of memorialize that because mm -hmm. That is the challenge uh, we're facing with public service is it can't just be done by all of us right. internally. Uh, and I say that now as someone who is sort of on the outside now, but even then, I look at what's going on, and I think this is maybe one of the first times you've had an assistant secretary on your show, mm -hmm. but if we only talk about what's going on in the private sector and in Silicon right. Valley, and we don't talk about what needs to also happen in the areas of public service, we in the United States will not be as strong as we could be, and we mm -hmm. as a world as well. So I think what you said there was really key about how do we make sure we get those people that do have good ideas for the country to a individual that can help action it? Right. And, and not just at the company level. You know, I'm fascinated by the power of crowdsourcing and taking the unique ideas, you know, and, and we've seen in some of our prize challenges and less traditional transactional um, technology efforts, there's, there are great ideas all around the country. And to the degree we can leverage those and enable Americans to help Americans, uh, even when it's part of our military, I think is, is there's great potential there. Uh, because there are great challenges and, and we can't solve them all on our own. Well, then why don't we finish up with one last question, which is what advice do you have for people out there who have great ideas. Let me, let me actually make this on two, two, two sides. So what advice do you have for people out there who might have great ideas? And at the same time, what advice do you have for people inside the, the government and inside the military who want to locate those ideas? Yeah, so, you know, I think on the government side, it's really about creating platforms that enable us to capture new ideas and interactions on a on a huge scale, not on a one by one, um, much more transactional um, area. So you're seeing us uh, doing much more engagement, getting our problems out there, experimenting more, not you know, being more comfortable looking at things in early development, or that might be purely commercial. And so I would just say for the folks inside the system is. There are great ideas everywhere, some within government, many outside government. Figure out how to leverage all the great ideas out there. Uh, if you're out there and have great ideas, um, if you don't know how to get them, get a hold of me. Um, but but look for, um, and we're pretty active in social media. We're active in uh, LinkedIn. We're active uh, on Facebook and whatnot. And, and we put a lot of things out in broad area announcements or um, experiment announcements. Look for those uh, and, and give us your ideas. Uh, and, and again, I've got I've to create the system that will look at all of those uh, and create new ways to interact. And Michael, if I can just add one more thing to what Hondo said, which is when you, whether you're on the inside or you're on the outside and you have an idea, make sure to focus on the outcome. Right. So don't sell it because it's innovative or because it's shiny. Make right. the case as to how does this increase pivot speed or how does it make things more agile or more adaptive or more resilient? What is the benefit to the operator? What is the benefit to the sailor, the folks that are out there on the line? And I think if you have that value mm -hmm. proposition up front, right. it will lead it and make it more possible to be actioned on if you have that in mind, is focus on the outcome 
as to what you actually achieve. Yeah, that's a great point, Dave. That's great advice. Focus on the outcomes. You know, we're we're out of time. Um, I hope you'll both come back and let's and we can do this again another time. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you as always, Michael. And a huge thank you to Hondo Gertz, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Navy, for responsible for acquisitions and technology, and to my old friend David Bray, who has certainly been on this show a number of times before, who is the Executive Director of People Centered Internet. I'm Michael Krigsman. You have been watching episode number 296 of CXO Talk. We have amazing shows coming up. Don't forget, subscribe on YouTube. Do that right now, please, and tell all your friends also. Tell your friends and your family. Okay, everybody, have a great weekend. We will see you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.